You may be seated. All right, good deal. Glad y'all are here. I want to welcome those who are watching online, which looks like it's a large number of y'all watching online today with so many people being out of town. Definitely be praying for all of our church family that are out of town still and enjoying their summer holidays and maybe hopefully watching online. And we want to encourage you to leave a comment. We'd really like to know where you're watching from. A couple weeks ago, we had people from Florida, Louisiana, and South Dakota and Arkansas watching. So let us know what state or what city you're watching from and, uh, and make any comments you want to do there and share it with us. And if this is your first time, we want to hook you up with a gift. In fact, we have a couple first time, several first time guests here this morning. Let's give them a hand. Welcome them to Revolution Church this morning. So be sure to go out to the table out there and get a gift. We want to thank you for being our guest here this morning. And one of the fun things we do here at Revolution is we have a question and answer session at the end of every message. And so if you have a question, anything about the Bible, about Christianity, about, you know, even if it's a skeptical question, you're not sure who Jesus is or any of this is real, feel free to ask a question. We're, we're not afraid of questions here. We, we welcome those kind of questions. Next Sunday, we're going to have a great time with our teenagers. We've invited teens from several other churches to do what we're calling a camp refresh. We're going to kind of go over some of the things they learned at camp this summer. You don't have to have been to camp, though, to come. So bring your friends, bring everybody. Hopefully we'll have a good turnout. We're going to play some games, have some prizes, eat lots of pizza, probably too much pizza, and then just have a good time. If you would like to help with this activity, let me know. We could use some adults to help serve pizza and some other things uh, with setup and cleanup and all that. Um, also, we, uh, our life groups will resume this week. Uh, with Paraland, Santa Fe, and Texas City. No, Texas City not, right? Okay, so Santa Fe and Paraland will resume their life groups this week. So if you want information about joining a small group where they have dinner and a good discussion and take some time to pray, and it's a great chance to meet friends and do life together, uh, text me. I can send you some details about that. Um, we got some news about the Honduras trip. And it might be on hold because we found out that the government is having a hard time processing passports now. That what used to take two to three weeks for an expedited passport is now taking 12. And if you do the math, that's putting us past when we were going to go. So uh, there's a good chance that I might be the only one going because I do have a passport or that none of us are going. But be praying about that. We'll see. We'll find out tomorrow morning some more definitive details about that. So uh, Evelyn back here. Raise your hand, Evelyn. So there was 20 students accepted into the Fire Academy, and only six graduated, and she was one of them. Let's give her a hand. <clears throat> and so, and uh, she's going to actually do their scripture reading for us later as well, so we're excited about that. Um, and let me, next week we'll do that. Hey, uh, I do something called Coffee with the Pastor, and uh, it, it's one of the fun times of my week where I just get to sit down face-to-face -face with one or two people and just, just share what God's doing in our life. So whether you've had coffee or a smoothie with me in the past several times or never, just text me and let's set that up. I'd love to meet with you and just answer any questions you have or just get to know you better. And um, let's see what else here. Also, we don't pass an offering basket here. We have a basket back at the table there. Or you can give via Venmo, which is the best way to give. And so there's the information right there at Revolution, uh, Revolution Church HTX. All right. And then... Um, Yes, we appreciate you guys being a generous church as our building fund continues to grow. We're excited about that. And I texted to the church this week to be praying about a meeting that I had this past week that I tell you what, I could just really tell that God's people were praying because the meeting went just exceptionally better than was expected. We had reason to believe that it wasn't going to go great, and it went super well. And I don't want to give you more details yet because it would be really premature, but we are starting the process of discussions with someone to get a building and, uh, and it's really close to here, too. So we're excited about the prospects of getting in our own building. Amen? That would be, be really cool. I mean, I really appreciate all the setup and takedown. But after a few years, it gets old. Right, Patrick? Yes. <laughs> so anyway, Patrick is, is a champion with that. We really appreciate that. Um, we are going to have communion after the message this morning. So be thinking towards that. That's always a special time for our church. And First John chapter 1, this is one of my favorite passages of Scripture. It's talking to believers, and John, who was Jesus' best friend, right? And uh, you don't have to watch The Chosen to know that. It comes right out of Scripture. Um, he, he writes this, talking to us. He says, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And we could be tempted to read that Scripture as in we have fellowship with one another. 
But if you read the verses before it and the verses after, it's talking about we have fellowship with God. It's all, every, the whole chapter is about Jesus, and it says if we have fellowship with one another, us and Jesus, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Now, if we're in denial, we say we have no sin, we're deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But here's the amazing promise. And would you read this out loud with me? Verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Isn't that an awesome promise? There's two key words that I, I have uh, highlighted there. Number one, confess. The Greek word is homologia. Homo means the same. Logia means logic or language or even the two combined. And so it means literally to speak the same language. Okay? A lot of times we think confessing your sins means I did this, I did this, I did this, amen, forgive me. You know, It's not reading a grocery list to God. It's saying the same thing about your sin that God says about your sin. So if you confess, let's say, a little white lie, are you speaking the same language that God is? Does God say little white lies? Is he anywhere in the Bible that say that? No, so if you're really not seeing your sin for what it is if you're not speaking the same language God is. You know, it'd be like if someone said something really bad about you, and they came up to you and said, okay, I'm sorry if I hurt your feelings. That's not what you're saying. You're like, man, you really crushed me with that. I thought we were friends, and, and they're not speaking the same language at all. They're kind of blowing it off. But if they say, you know what, that was really just unkind of me, and I am so sorry that I was so inconsiderate. Now, guess what? You're speaking the same language, right? So confessing sin is more than just saying the right words. It's having the right attitude of the heart. So we're going to take some time right now to go to the Lord and confess our sins and just, just ask Him to clear our hearts and our minds and isn't it awesome that he's faithful and just to do it every single time? So let's pray. I'm going to give you just a few seconds of silence where you can take care of that yourself. And then I'll, I'll pray for us together. Father in heaven, we thank you so much that Jesus Christ died to pay the penalty for all of our sins. We are not worthy. We are not deserving of anything he's done, but yet he loved us so much. We accept that free gift, and we thank you for the forgiveness that goes with it. So, Lord, uh, we could spend a lot of time finding out what's wrong with us, but we're so thankful that you do forgive. So now I pray that you just wipe the slate clean, clear our hearts and our minds so that we could focus on Jesus this morning. That's our purpose to be here this morning, to worship God passionately, to love one another genuinely, and to, to start a revolution in the world around us. So we thank you for Jesus being here in our midst. I pray that he'd be glorified in everything. In his name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Let, let's stand and sing together. Explode and bring the dead to life. Love so bold to see a revolution somehow. Darkness 
praise and most of all for your grace and for your mercy lord and for sending your son to die for us lord while yet we were still sinners lord you died for us lord. we thank you for that i pray for gary as he leads us into your word and i pray for our hearts as we're listening just that we're able to receive your guidance today lord in jesus name i pray amen Well, welcome to Revolution Church. We're so glad all y'all are here this morning. Some of you are first-time guests, some are second-time guests, and many of you are watching online, being out of town, so we're glad you're able to do that, and we're glad we have that technology. And uh, if you're new to Revolution, we like to go through books of the Bible. We like to study it the way God delivered it, and right now we're in the, the book of Deuteronomy, and Evelyn, why don't you come up here? We like to have people read the scripture for us, and so Evelyn's going to do that for us. And you're going to have an opportunity to uh, interact with her. Um, there's a lot of verses. In fact, there's 12 of them towards the end that said, and all the people said, amen. That's your cue. It's, and I have it in blue so you won't forget to just say amen. Can you do that? All right, good deal. 
All right, so Evelyn, uh, first of all, tell us what God's doing in your life besides graduating from Fire Academy. Thank you. Um, I'm just so grateful to be here. Um, I came with my brother-in-law and my sister. They invited me here um, a couple months ago, and I love it here. I love everyone here. <laughs> Man, well, we're glad to have you here. All right. And look at this. If this was a ship, this, this ship would be leaning this way. Look at y'all. That's funny. <laughs> All right. Go ahead, Evelyn. Now Moses and the elders of Israel commanded the people, saying, Keep the whole com commandment that I command you today. And on the day that you cross over the Jordan to the land of the Lord your God is giving you, you shall set up large stones and plaster them with plaster, and you shall write on them all the words of this law when you cross over to enter the land that the Lord your God is giving you a land flowing with milk and honey as the Lord the God of your fathers has promised you and when you have crossed over the Jordan you shall set up these stones concerning which I command you today on Mount Ebel and you shall plaster them with plaster and there you shall build an altar to the Lord your God, an altar of stones. You shall wield no iron tool on them. You shall build an altar to the Lord your God of uncut stones, and you shall offer burnt offerings on it to, to the Lord your God. And you shall sacrifice peace offerings and shall eat there, and, and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God. And you shall write on the stones all the words of the law very plainly. Then Mo Moses and the Levit Levitical priests said to all Israel, Keep silence and hear, O Israel, this day, this day you have become the people of the Lord your God. You shall therefore obey the voice of the Lord your God, keeping his commandments and his stat stat status statutes which I command you today. The day Moses charged the people, saying, When you have crossed over the Jordan, these shall stand on the Mount Gerizim to bless the people. Simeon. Simeon. There Simeon. You Levi. Judah. Isaac. Issachar. Issachar. Joseph and Benjamin. Good job. And these shall stand on the Mount Abel, for the curse, Reuben, Gad, Asher, Sebulun, Dan, and Naphtali. And the Levites shall declare to all the men of Israel in, the, in a loud voice, Cursed be the man who makes a carved or cast metal image and an ab ab abomination. abomination. <laughs> Big word. To the Lord. A thing made by hands of a craft, craftsman, and sets it up for, in secret. And all the people shall answer and say, Amen. Amen. Good job. <clears throat> Curse be anyone who dishonors his father or his mother, and all the people shall say, Amen. Amen. Curse be anyone who moves his neighbor's landmark, and all the people shall say, Amen. Amen. Cursed be anyone who misleads a blind man on the road, and all the people shall say, Amen. Amen. Cursed be anyone who perverts the justice due to the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow, and all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed be anyone who lies with his father's wife, because he has uncovered his father's nakedness, and all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed be anyone who lies with any kind of animal, and all the people shall say, Amen. Amen. Cursed be anyone who lies with his sisters, whether the daughter of his father or the daughter of his mother, and all the people shall say, Amen. Amen. Cursed be anyone who lies with his mother-in-law, and all the people shall say, Amen. Amen. Cursed be anyone who strikes down his neighbor in secret, and all the people shall say, Amen. Amen. Cursed be anyone who takes a bribe to shed innocent blood, and all the people shall say, Amen. Amen. Cursed be anyone who does not confirm the words of this law by doing them, and all the people shall say, Amen. Amen. 
Good job. Appreciate you. All right. She had some tough words in there, didn't she? And you guys did a good job of saying amen. You almost felt like you were a, an excited church there. So I know sometimes we do say amen, but somebody tell me, what does the word amen mean? So be it or let it be so. Let it be true in my life. So if someone encouraged you to do something right, you're saying, okay, I agree. Amen. I will let that be true in my life. So there are five points in this passage right here. In fact, I had to read chapter 27, and we, we don't apologize for reading long chapters. We do a chapter time. But I'm actually going to go into the first half of chapter 28 this morning, too. And we're just going to do a bird's eye view of all of this, okay? Um, but do you remember when you were in school, you had to memorize certain things, and the way you memorized it was repetition. You said it over and over and over again. You know, if you wanted to learn the periodic table or a certain section of it, you had to just flip through your cards and memorize them and just do it over and over and over again. Repetition is a key way to learn. And that's what Deuteronomy is about. The word Deuteronomy is Latin for the second giving of the law. Moses is basically repeating the Ten Commandments from Exodus, but he's going into further detail, kind of like he did in Leviticus as well. And so in Exodus, Leviticus, and in Deuteronomy, it's the law, the law, the law. And lots of repetition of laws that the people would not forget because they didn't walk around with Bibles or version apps on their phone. They had to hear it and hear it and hear it. And especially in this case, they were going to write it on big stones so when people passed by the big stones, they would see it. So here's the, the five main points of this passage we're going to cover this morning. There is keeping the commands of the Lord, building an altar to the Lord, being the people of the Lord, avoiding the curses of the Lord, and receiving the blessings of the Lord. Now, how many would you agree there were some awkward verses in there? <laughs> how many of you were blushing while, and we were all blushing for Evelyn while she was reading them? And so there were some awkward verses there. But again, if you're kind of new to the Bible, or you read the Bible, and you're not really sure if this thing is legit, or if it's, it seems kind of weird and old, outdated, Every time you read something bizarre in the Bible, realize it's a reaction to something bizarre going in, on in the culture. And if you think these things don't happen anymore, you're wrong, okay? All the things that she just read that Moses is saying, hey, don't do these things, today people still do. And it, you know, we don't talk about it because those are things that should be done in darkness because they're just wrong and nobody would walk around saying, hey, I do these things. But these things are still done and we still need a warning against them. But again, what is the purpose of the law? It's not a way, the law is not a way to life. The law is a way of life. Jesus is the way to life. The, the law is just a way of life. But here's the second big thing about the law. It shows us what utter failures we are. How you, you read the Ten Commandments. Let's just start right at the top. First and foremost, what's the most important one? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. How many of you did that perfectly this week? How many of you probably even did it more than half the time this week? We, very few could even say we do that all the Lord with all, all the time, with all our heart. It's difficult to do because you know who we tend to love more than God? Us. We tend to love us more than we love God. So it's, it's difficult, and the law is a reminder that you are a sinner in need of a Savior. Now, I realize that that's not popular preaching today. Most popular preaching is, yeah, you just be the best you can be. You're wonderful. You're amazing. But the truth is, yes, we have potential to be wonderful, amazing in Christ, but we also struggle with this sinful person that we have to live inside of every day. And we struggle with not being the husband we should be, not being the dad we should be, not being the best employee we should be. And we have to go to the Lord for help every day and do it in His strength. So let's, let's move through these quickly here. First of all, there's the keeping the commands of the Lord. And it's interesting that Moses said, and now Moses and the elders, so this isn't just Moses talking. How many elders are there? Remember last week we learned there's 70 elders, okay? His father-in-law Joseph advised him to delegate this. And so we're not talking about a handful of people who have come out of slavery in the wilderness. We're talking about 1.4 to maybe even as high as 2 million people. So this assembly here, which we'll talk about where he's doing this speech, it's pretty massive. This is bigger than any ball game, you know, in the big the big horseshoe or, you know, the big house or any of those big college venues. And he says, you keep the whole law commandment that I've commanded you today. The whole law meaning that we don't pick and choose. We live in a society today where people pick and choose. Well, I like this part of the Bible, but I don't like that part of the Bible. 
You know, as if you can pick and choose and make God the buffet you want him to be, where you're like, well, I like that, but I don't like this, and you kind of move along. God's not a buffet, and God wants you to pick all of it. And yes, there are parts of the Bible that make me feel uncomfortable. But guess what? If, if God is created in your image instead of you being created in his image, then you've got a carved image and you've created your own God. And really, that God probably looks a lot like you. And so you're right back to worshiping yourself again. I, I'm so glad that Tammy is very opposite of me in many, many ways. Because if she was just like me, one of us wouldn't be necessary. But she shows me things in myself that I cannot see. And if your spouse can do that for you, just think how much more God does that for you when he's the opposite of you in some ways and you read tough scriptures like man that just doesn't seem right that doesn't seem fair do you want a God that just goes along with everything you say no I don't think we want that and here's what's interesting he says keep the whole commandment that I've commanded you today in other words he's saying you guys have messed up so many times in the past you guys complained you guys were murmuring you didn't like the leader I gave you you didn't like the food I gave you you complain. You wanted to go back into slavery in Egypt, which was quite the hyperbole. You just wanted to do all kinds of stuff. You really were a bunch of brats out there in the wilderness. But you know what? Clean slate. Today, let's start over. And aren't you glad God gives us second chances like that? So, uh, yeah, you guys do good at that amen thing. You guys are warmed up, ready to go, okay? And he says, you shall set up large stones and plaster them with plaster. This was not a brand new thing. This was a thing that a lot of ancient societies did all around them. And so it was not unusual when they went through the land of Canaan that they saw big stones plastered with plaster. Now, most of them, they had cut and they had shaped and they'd had craftsmen who were very skilled to read, walk up and look at that rock and say, man, isn't that impressive the way that that was cut out and the shape and the ornamental design they put around it? As you'll see here, God doesn't want them to do it that way. But this was a custom where they would plaster it with almost basically like cement and then right in it while it was still wet, and then they would smooth it out. And these craftsmen would do a pretty amazing job with this. And they would do it with plaster, or like I said, a type of cement, to where it would be seen for everybody to read as they pass through the, the, these areas. It is a wise practice to have Scripture visible to us as reminders of the importance of God's Word to a God throughout our day. Okay? Uh, one of the gifts we give to our first-time guests is uh, men, 101 favorite Bible verses for men. And we do the same thing for women. And to have those cards in front of you, to be able to read them. How many of you ever take a scripture and write it on a post-it note and stick it on your rear view mirror or your mirror or your refrigerator? You guys do that, right? Those are great things to do to remind you of God's word all throughout the day and make that practice where you spend time in God's word every day. The second thing we see is building an altar to the Lord. Building an altar to the Lord. Now, one of the common criticisms of Christianity is, why are you guys so obsessed with blood and sacrifice and killing animals and all that stuff like that? It's because sin brings pain. In fact, sin brings a lot more than pain. It brings death. And every time, now think about this, every time they sacrifice an animal, they didn't just sacrifice ugly animals. Like, wouldn't it be cool if they said, you know, sacrifice an armadillo? You know, those are such ugly critters who, uh, sure, I'd be glad to kill one of those. But no, it's take Fuzzy the lamb, the cutest little animal you have, and sacrifice it. It's like, what? But that lamb has done nothing wrong. Bingo. It's a picture of who? It's a picture of Jesus who did absolutely nothing wrong, but he took that punishment. So yes, we don't like, it. God is not like, oh, I love killing animals. It's not that. It's God saying, hey, I want you to show you what sin does. It, cause, it kills beautiful things in our lives. And so I want you to run away. And also think about this. A thought occurred to me this past week is, you know, they had certain scheduled sacrifices, but they also had sacrifices, as we'll talk about here in a little bit, that when they messed up and they sinned, they brought a voluntary sacrifice to God and said, God, I've messed up, and they'd sacrifice it. So you know what? If you had a really bad sin, a bad habit, You'd be killing lambs all the time. And you're like, hey, you know, I really want to quit because I'm going to go broke killing all my livestock. You know, and there's an incentive. And see, because we don't sacrifice animals, and there's a good reason we don't because Jesus is the ultimate sacrifice, and so that's done away with. But imagine if every time you sinned, you had to give an extra hundred bucks or you had to burn something that you loved. I mean, you'd get down to nothing really quick. 
And that's the lesson that God wanted him to see. And he says, I, he says, I, I want this to be an altar of stone, but I don't want you to touch it with any craftsmanship, no iron, no tools. Because here's what I want. I want you to walk up to this big rock. And I think these were pretty massive. They were big enough for several men to move, but they were big enough to where one person couldn't move them. You see, they were big enough to be like a monument, but it would take a lot of work to move them because they did have to put them in certain places. But when you walked up to them, you would not be impressed with, wow, man, those guys did a great job. Aren't we impressed with how cool they are? No, it was, this rock is natural. This is the way God made it. What we're supposed to be impressed with is what's written on it. Okay, we have to be careful we're not impressed with the works of man because the works of man have nothing to do with redeeming our soul. The works of man are what got us in trouble in the first place. But God puts these things before us to show us how to guide us and to live our lives. And he says, so these uncut stones, a natural, you're going to do burnt offerings. And there's, there's several types of offerings in the Bible. We'll talk about them, which ones are which. Um, but you would burn them there. Titus 3, 5 says, He saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to His own mercy. What is mercy? When God doesn't give us what we do deserve. Okay, if someone's merciful to you, you deserve to be punished. They say, you know what? I'm going to show you mercy. I'm not going to give you what you do deserve. So how did we become saved? Not because of things that we did. And that's what the whole uncut stones were about. You wouldn't walk up there and say, hey, I cut that stone. No, God cut that stone. We're just supposed to pay attention to what's said on it. But how are we saved? By the washing of regeneration. In other words, a new birth and the renewal of the Holy Spirit. I had a, I had a long discussion with a guy at, uh, recently at a gym, and he comes from a denomination that teaches that you've got to do good things to stay saved. And we, I went through scriptures like this, and I'm like, you and I can't be good enough to be saved. In fact, being saved has nothing to do with anything we do, but everything with what Christ did. When Jesus put out his arms on the, that cross and took those nails for you and me, he said on the cross, it is finished. The, the, the Greek word is totalistai. What is he talking about? What, what was finished? Everything that needed to be done to save you and me. Everything to save our souls was done on that cross. You, don't, you cannot, nor do you need to add anything to that. So I asked the guy, we, after we were trading verses back and forth and trying to explain what our take on these verses were, I finally said to him, I said, you know what, let's just take a big step back. If what I'm saying is true, that I'm saved just by the mercy of God, and I don't have to do anything else to, to go to heaven, what makes me do the good things I do? He said, because you love God. I said, but if I could lose my salvation, it's based on how good I am, what makes me try to live a Christian life? To not go to hell. You see, the motivation of one is just pure love for God, and I'm so thankful, God, you saved me. I want to live my life for you. The other is, I don't want to go to hell. I don't want to go to hell. So guess what? It's still all about me. And so I'm going to give money to the church because I don't want to go to hell. I'm, I'm not going to commit that sin because I don't want to go to hell. And, and it's still all about you. And you've not realized what the grace of God is all about, that God has saved you. And then I shared the other analogy with him. I said, that, that's why the Bible talks about a regeneration, a new birth. Jesus says, you can't even see heaven unless you are what? Born again. So I said, your son over there. I said, if he misbehaves today, are you going to say, you're not my son anymore, go away? I said, no, what are you going to do? You're going to discipline him because you love him. And you could tell some of these thoughts were hitting home. So, you know, just pray for the guy. Um, but there, so many of the world's religions, in fact, all the world's religions except for true Christianity are all about what you do, what you do. You know, you've you got to obey these seven laws. You've got to fast these certain days. You've got to go to a temple or you've got to go to a synagogue or you've got to go somewhere, a mosque, and you do this, you do this, you do this, and you don't do these. And if you're good enough, God weighs your good versus your bad. And hopefully you're, the scale tips in your favor and you go to heaven throw all that in the trash can. The Bible teaches the exact opposite of all these things. So um, he says, and you shall offer peace offerings. We're going to talk about all the different offerings here in a minute. And you shall eat there and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God. So here it was, you sacrifice an animal, but then you basically had a barbecue and you and the Levite 
and you invited the widows and the homeless and everybody to come, and you had a big party for several days, and the word rejoice basically means the party before the Lord. You had this big party. What are you partying about? You're celebrating the grace of God, that God loves us, and he forgives our sins, and this animal is a representation of that. So here's the five offerings we see in Exodus, Leviticus, and Deuteronomy. There's the burnt offering, which was voluntary. You did it whenever you felt necessary to say, hey, God, I'm committed totally to you. I want to be totally devoted to you. There was the grain offering, which always went with the drink offering. So basically what you did is you took your grain. Sometimes you just present the grain to the Lord raw, but oftentimes they would bake it into a big loaf of bread, and then they'd take the fruit of the vine, and they'd basically wave the, the big loaf of bread to say, God, thank you for blessing us with food and with drink. And then they would either pour the drink on the ground or sometimes they would pour it on the fire where they had burnt the burnt offering. And so that was also voluntary. Just say, hey, God, thank you for being so good to us. And then there was the peace offering, which is what you would do with other people. Again, it was voluntary. You and another family would get together and do a peace offering to show that, hey, we love each other. We're neighbors. Or maybe we weren't getting along, but now we are, and so we're at peace together, and you did that. Then there was two mandatory offerings, which Leviticus spells out over and over again. In fact, you could follow these five offerings in Leviticus 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, just like that, nice and easy. Um, the sin offering was if you'd messed up or you came into some uncleanness, like you touched something dead or you defiled yourself by obeying the law somehow, um, you committed a sin, and so therefore you made a sacrifice in that sense. And then there was the guilt, or, and the sin offering could be any type of animal, um, anything down from pigeons all the way up to oxen, depending on how wealthy you were. Uh, then there was the guilt or trespass offering, which again was mandatory, but it's when you did something unintentionally. Like you, you just stumbled across that and something happened. And you, maybe you hit somebody, you did something bad. Uh, these are things. Now, all these things were under Deut Deuteronomy law, okay? Do we live under Deuteronomy law today? No, thank the Lord. Jesus fulfilled the law. Jesus says, I didn't come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. He says, so you don't have to do all these things. I fulfilled all these things. Now, there are basic principles of Deuteronomy we apply today. But again, Deuteronomy, these people were living under theocracy. They're living under wartime. And just like our great-grandparents, they had to ration sugar. They had to ration fuel. They could only do so much. They had a lot of weird laws back then under World War I and World War II. Because why? They were at war. And so when you see a lot of strange laws in Deuteronomy, it's because why? They're at war. They, they, they have to live on a strict lifestyle. Um, so then it goes on to say here in the next verse, verse 10, and it says, and by that we'll ha we have been sanctified. I'm sorry. So let, let me give a little context here. So Hebrews is writing to Jewish people who are not sure if Jesus is the Messiah. So we're fast forwarding a couple thousand years. And in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 10 says, And by that we will have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ. So Jesus said basically all those lambs, all those sheep, all those oxen, I fulfill all those. Those were just shadows, Hebrews tells us, of what was to come. So sometimes in your house or even outside, you'll see somebody's shadow before you see them especially if like, they're walking around the side of the building, the sun's behind them, you'll see their shadow, and then they appear. That's exactly what the Old Testament was. It was a shadow of Christ's coming. All those sacrifices pointed forward to him. And he offered his own body as a sacrifice, and he did it what? Once for all. Notice, for all time, for all sacrifices were all fulfilled in him. And verse 11 says, And every priest stands... In the Old Testament, every priest stands daily at his service. They had to do it over and over and over and over again, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices over and over and over. And guess what? None of them can ever fully take away sins. They're just pictures. But when Christ offered for all time one single sacrifice, then what did he do? He sat down. You know what's interesting? In, in the tabernacle and later in the temple, there was no furniture for the priest to sit because their work was never done. Because guess what? We never stop sinning. We sin and we sin and we sin. And the priests are like, man, I wish these people would stop singing. <laughs> I got to keep sacrificing and sacrificing. And, and that's why there were so many Levitical priests. I mean, there was a whole nation, a, a, whole, a whole tribe of guys whose job was to do nothing but to atone for your sins in the picture of what Christ was going to do in the future. But Jesus, the great high priest, he went in not with a lamb, but he was the lamb. 
That's why his cousin John the Baptist says, Behold, the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. And in the Greek there, the word takes away means for once and for all time, he wipes out all sin. And Jesus offers himself. And then when his body's in the tomb, he doesn't go to hell like some people teach. His body went to the grave, but he went to the throne, to the true um, Ark of the Covenant. And he sprinkled his blood on the altar like a high priest. Not the blood of a lamb, not the blood of an ox, but his own blood. And then guess what he did? He sat down. In other words, it's done. It's totally done. Everything to forgive you and I was done at the cross of Jesus Christ and his blood on the true altar of God. So the third point is here, being the people of God. Then Moses and the Levitical priests said to all of Israel, keep silence and hear, O Israel. Now imagine telling about one and a half million people, okay, right, be quiet. Then they all hush. And it was like this natural amphitheater between Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim. And I'll show you a picture of here in a minute. It says, this day you have become the people of the Lord your God. I imagine there was a great round of applause then. They were excited about this. And so they were, they were truly God's chosen people. And he says, you shall therefore, because you are the people of God, watch this, therefore you shall obey. Do you see where I'm going with this? The world religions does it like this way. Oh, you obey, you become the people of God. God says, no, no, you're my people. Now do what I say. I don't do good works to become a Christian. I do good works because I am a Christian. I don't do good deeds so that I get to go to heaven. I do good things because I am going to heaven. I'm excited about it. And I want to live a life of thanksgiving to the Lord. So here, notice what comes first. And, and again, we saw this before last week where he brought them out of Egypt and out of bondage. And then he gave them Ten Commandments. He didn't say, hey, here's Ten Commandments. You keep them, you get to get out. It's not the way it works. God chooses you. He puts his love on you. He makes you his child. And he says, because I love you and I want you to love me, now go obey and keep my commandments. And that's where a lot of people run into a wall. Jesus said in Luke 6, 46, he said, why do you, and I'm going to just give you the Gary version, why do you even bother to call me a Lord? And you don't even do what I tell you to do. Man, the world is full of people like that. Oh, yeah, I'm a Christian. And they live like the devil. And I'm not trying to sound better than people like that. I, I, I was one of those people for a while, okay? So what I'm trying to say this as a loving warning to you, that if you say, I'm a Christian, but your life over here is doing things you know is not pleasing to God. Let, let's just forget God's standard for a second. Let's say what your standard of life is and what you think is right and wrong. You can't even keep your own level of right and wrong. Do you know that? Think about what you think is right and wrong and how often. Like, is there anybody in this room thinks lying is okay? And yet I guarantee you, Every single one of you in this room said something this past week that was not true or probably highly exaggerated. <clears throat> and yet your own standards, I, I don't want to do that, but yet you do. I mean, we can even go, we, we, there's all kinds of things we say, oh, well, I'm not going to do that anymore. And then you're right back there again. So even your standards here, God's standards here. And Jesus says, you know, and you don't even do the things I tell you. There's like a total disconnect. You want to claim me as Lord and Savior, but what I tell you to do, you don't do it. And I'm not saying, again, to do this in order to be saved, but to prove that you are. Verse 47 says, everyone who comes to me and hears my word and does them, I will show you what he's like. He's like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the what? Right. And we know the rest of the story. You know, one guy builds his house on the sand, one builds it on the rock. But the rock is not just Jesus himself, but what Jesus says. You can't disconnect Jesus from his commands and his order for our life. Um, a year and a half ago, I went, Tammy and I went to her uncle's funeral, Uncle Bill, right? Bob, Uncle Bob. Uncle Bob was a great man. Godly man, loved the Lord, served the Lord, was great to his children and his grandchildren, honest in his business. And they, at his funeral, they were just, everybody was standing up and sharing what a blessing he was to them. And it was really cool how many of his grandkids just talked about how Uncle Bob just loved the Lord, and he taught me the Bible, and just great things like that. And Bob's sister, Mary, which one was it? Mary got up and said, you know, she talked about Tammy's dad, too, who just passed away the year before that. And she said what good men they were and how that was just the offered way. That's just the way we were taught. That's the way we were raised, to just do right, to be honest, to work hard, to love your family, love your children. It was the offered way. And I was thinking, yeah. That's a good way for the offers to be. 
because the offered way was God's way. And, and, and there's a, God has a certain way he wants his people to live. Does he expect you to be perfect? No. He knows you're not going to be perfect as long as you're in this life. But you have choices. And here's the thing. You honor God by your choices. Every day you're making choices all day long. And you're going to be like, do I, do I please myself or do I please God? Now, did you know that many times the decision can please you and God at the same time? Okay? There's, God is not an old prude up in heaven trying to spoil all your fun. In fact, when God says, thou shalt not, what he's saying is don't hurt yourself. It's just like when you tell your kid, and he's walking with a fork over to the plug. Hey, no, don't do that. And your two-year-old's going, like, but dad, this is so much fun. Watch me. And you're like, no, don't do that. You'll hurt yourself. Why would dad not want me to stick the dishes? It looks, looks like lots of fun to stick this fork in the plug. You know, but your dad knows something that you don't. Because when he was two-year-old, he shocked himself and has been stupid ever since. Okay? So your parents are trying to protect you. And God, your heavenly father, is trying to protect you. And he wants you to live his way. So it then talks about avoiding the curses of the Lord. <clears throat> He says that, that then that day Moses charged the people saying, when you have crossed it, when you have crossed over. Now let's not forget the story here. Moses has led these idiotic people for all this time. 40, he got them out of Egypt. God used him to perform all these miracles to take on the greatest empire on the planet, the Egyptian empire. And God used him to deliver these people out of slavery. And what did they give him in exchange? Complaints. And at one point, they complained so much, God said, you know what, I've had enough. I'm just ready to strike them all dead. And God, Moses said, God, don't strike me dead instead. Wow. Anybody in here willing to do that for a bunch of people complaining about you? And that, that's exactly what Moses did. And yet, because Moses had a temper tantrum and he struck the rock a second time, uh, you can go back and read about that story, but he, God says, you know what, you've crossed the line. And I'm going to let you continue to lead these people, but you're not going in the promised land. You're going to lead them right up to the edge. So here's Moses. I imagine tears are in his eyes. And he's saying, when you guys cross over and, and I stay here and I die, you know, he said, you cross over the Jordan the River, there shall stand Mount Gerizim to bless the people. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to take six of the tribes and put them on one hillside call a mountain, but you know how it's like in Kentucky, they call them mountains, and they're really, Colorado has mountains, and Kentucky has hills, and Texas has nothing. So uh, maybe West Texas. But anyway, you put on these, these six tribes over on this side, and then on Mount Ebal, you're going to put another six tribes over there, and then all of the Levites, which is a tribe that had no property, you, they're going to declare in a very loud voice, they're going to they're basically read all the law to you. So here's, here's what it looks like today. On one side, you see Mount Gerizim. On the other side, you see Mount Ebal. And then there's the Valley of Shechem. And so I imagine that Moses and the Levites are standing in the middle and the six tribes on either side. It's a natural amphitheater. So they're wondering, how, how do one and a half million people hear? This is how. God didn't need microphones. This is how it did. That, that's why you see Jesus teaching many times on hillsides and a natural amphitheater sit, setting so all the people could hear them. So these 12 commandments... We're expanding upon the Ten Commandments in Leviticus. And how many tribes are there? And how many commands does he give here today? He gives 12. So it's basically one for each tribe in, in many ways in a symbolic sense. And so he's telling them, avoid all these curses. So don't have any secret crafted images, okay? He's, and he clearly said secret because by now nobody has the nerve to set it up out in public. They've just shattered all of the, uh, the idols of the Canaanites. But he's saying, don't even have one in secret. You know, the test of your character is who you are when no one's around. And that's what God's saying. Am I truly your God, even when no one is watching? What do you watch on your phone when no one is watching? Where do you surf when no one is watching? Who are you having online conversations with when no one is watching? How about when no one's near your office and you're doing something that makes the numbers dishonest? Who, who are you serving? You see, the true test of our Christianity is what we do when no one's watching in secret. Then he reinforces the whole idea of don't dishonor your parents. Our whole society, we don't have jails. We don't have juvenile detention centers. Our whole society hinges upon you obey God by obeying your parents. And if you obey your parents, we'll be a strong nation. <clears throat> and he says, don't move your neighbor's landmark. Think, What's that about? There were, landmarks served several different purposes, but one of the main purposes was this marked my property separating from yours. 
And what you could do if you really wanted to harvest more grain or more barley is when your neighbor wasn't looking, you'd get a couple oxen and slide that, that, uh, that landmark over a few yards and then you know, kind of cover up the grass around and all that stuff. And so nobody would know. And basically you would steal maybe a tenth of an acre at a time from your neighbor. And, and he's saying, he's reinforcing the eighth commandment, thou shalt not steal. You see each one where I say first and second, fifth, eighth, it's, each, it's a reinforcement of the 10 commandments he gave previously. This one's really funny. Imagine a blind guy's walking down the road and you say, hey, let me help you over here. And you help him walk down the road, long road. You know, what kind of jerk is that? So that's like the, the 11th commandment, don't be a jerk. And then the number five there is, those who pervert justice for the helpless. And he lists three types of helpless. And it, you see this over and over again in Deuteronomy. Widows, orphans, and sojourners. The orphans being the fathers, yes. So widows, women who've lost their husband in a society and in a world that wasn't very friendly to women, take good care of them, which was the opposite of what the world did. Remember what one, one of Jesus' big beefs with the Pharisees was? You abuse widows. Imagine that. Abusing widows. You know, you watch all these um, so-called Christian television programs that say, you know, send us your $100 now and God will bless you and do all this stuff. You know, the overall majority of the money they get in those ministries is from widows. Women who are on fist, fixed incomes, they've lost their husband, they're collecting Social Security, and they're wondering how they're going to make it. And this jerk on television says, if you'll send some of your money to me, I promise God's going to bless you as they drive around their private jets wearing their Rolexes. Nothing new under the sun, eh, right? He said it here in Deuteronomy, don't take advantage of widows. Jesus told the Pharisees, you guys are snakes and vipers because you take advantage of widows. And even today here in the 21st century, we still got people believing these charlatans on television. So we, we have a society that tends to take advantage of people. You know, a girl that's homeless on the street, rather than helping her, she gets drawn into sex trafficking. A sojourner who is desperate to feed his family, traveling to a country that's not his, rather than helping him, we take advantage of him and make him do labor and then turn on, don't pay him or underpay him severely. Nothing's changed. And this is why these commandments are still relevant today. And then you see four commandments that have to do with sexual morality, okay? And they get pretty weird. And again, anytime you read something weird in the Bible, don't blame it on God. God's dealing with the weird world. Man, you guys, that, don't mess with your animals. That's gross. Don't mess with your sister. That's gross. And you know that up until this time, people could marry their sisters or could marry different people. And of course, why did John the Baptist get his head cut off? Because he went to Philip and said, hey, you've got, you, took, you killed your brother then took his wife. You're wicked. You're evil. You know, nothing changes. And these, are, these commandments, if you think they're old and outdated, we live in a super immoral world. Uh, pornography is a trillion dollar industry on our planet. Mind blowing that people are that desperate to watch things that are just perverted and lewd and not the way God would want them to watch. <clears throat> and then the last three, it talks about murder in secret. Don't kill somebody secretly because they thought, well, it's like a tr if a tree falls in the wilderness and so no one's there to hear it, doesn't make a sound. You know, they, had, they started thinking, well, the Bible says you have to be two or three witnesses to be guilty. If I can do this when nobody's watching, then I'm not guilty. No, 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 you're still guilty. You're just lucky that nobody saw you and God will still find you out. And don't let someone bribe you to kill someone else. We'll say, well, actually it wasn't me killing them. He paid for it, so therefore it's on him. No, no, you're both guilty. And then he says, basically reinforces the first commandment, to love God by keeping his commandments. He says, if you fail to confirm all these things and say amen to all these things, you will be cursed. And you say, Gary, do you, do you believe there's still curses today? Yes, I do. I, I believe, number one, there's natural consequences. If you speed often enough, you will get lots of tickets or you will find yourself wrapped around a telephone pole. And that's just natural consequences. But I also believe that if you're God's child, he will discipline you. And maybe you could say that's not a curse, and maybe I would say you're probably right. But are there negative reactions for your actions? Yes, there are. For every action, there's equal and opposite reaction. And sometimes, if you mess around with Satan, the reaction is not equal and opposite. Have you ever done something that you thought was like this bad, but then you got in trouble this bad? If you think that's not fair, don't play the game with Satan, because he doesn't play fair at all. Okay, he will make sure you reap far more than what you've sown. 
And so we need to confirm these commandments. And it says, and all the people replied, amen. And so it, it, it's a good thing to do in church. You know, as a pastor, I enjoy hearing it. So many of you do that sometimes, but feel free to say that, even if it's under your breath, as a, a response to God that, you know what? The Holy Spirit just convicted me that I needed to hear that. Amen. So be it. Let that be true in my life from this day forward. So then receiving the blessings of the Lord. Now we get to the good stuff. In chapter 28, he says, and if you faithfully obey, it's conditional. The blessings are conditional. Now notice that being saved is not conditional. He doesn't say, if you fully obey, you can still stay God's children. No, he's saying, because you're God's children, if you obey and you're really careful, which it takes, it takes intentionality. We've got to purpose these things in our hearts like Daniel did. If you'll do these things, then all these blessings will come upon you. So please understand that when we're talking about being a born-again Christian, it's not based on your obedience. It's based on Jesus' obedience. He obeyed fully, and we receive his righteousness. We disobeyed fully. It all goes upon him. It's the great exchange. And it says all these blessings shall come upon you. Because Moses is saying, because I'm not going to be there. Don't ever detach the, the people from the story in this situation. And there's even an interesting chiastic structure in this. And Charles asked me uh, on last week's question and answer, do, do I get these from other teachers or do I discover myself? Probably 80% of the time I see them, you know, in the commentaries I read. But this one I actually came across on my own. And a chiastic structure, for those who knew, is we think in the West linearly. We start at the beginning of the story, and we say, then this happened, then this happened, and this happened, this happened, and then this happened, and everybody lived happily ever after. But in Hebrew, they told the story like with an introduction, and they worked their way into the main point of the story, and then they worked their way out and basically retell the story backwards. So he starts off saying, if you faithfully obey, and how does he end it? If you faithfully obey. And then he talks about doing all his commandments, and notice the word all there, not picking and choosing. And then the main point, the main center point is, if you obey the Lord your God, he will set you above all the nations of the earth. The whole point of the Ten Commandments, the whole point of Leviticus, the whole primary point of Deuteronomy was that these people would live so different that just their lifestyle would be above and beyond. People like, man, I don't really like those people, but you've got to admit, God's blessing them. You, and now yeah, they have some really weird laws, but man, they love to obey those laws. They really do love their God. There's something different about them. And when, what happens with that is people like Rahab the harlot who lived in Jericho, but she said, all the people around us are in fear and trembling because we see the way that you live. Is there a spider over there or something? A big wasp. Okay, Charles, be the man and kill it with the chancla. There we go. All right, Patrick, your turn. And now he comes towards me. There we go. Good deal. I'll take communion. All right. Crazy things happen every Sunday around here. All right. I did that to bail you out, Marcel, because people were thinking, that lady's crazy up there. What's going on? <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I'd be scared too. All right. Jimmy looked more scared than you, so just say it. All right. Um, the whole purpose of the law was to set them apart. Think about this. Whatever God's asking you to do, and even the ones you think are a bit difficult, He's doing it so you'll be a different kind of people. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 16, Let your light so shine before men that they may what? See your good works. And as a response, what? Glorify your Father in heaven. The whole purpose of the Christian lifestyle is not to earn salvation, but to show salvation to other people. Say, look, I'm saved. This is what my life is different because I'm saved. I'm not doing this in order to earn this and for selfish reasons. And so that's an interesting point there about that. That's the center. Verse 2 says, and all these blessings shall be upon you, and you again, and watch this, and overtake you. That phrase just blew my mind this week because I read that. Every time you see the phrase in Hebrew, overtake you, it's talking about one army catching up and destroying another, chasing them down. And God's saying, you know, my blessings, you can't even run from them if you wanted to. If you obey me, my blessings will hunt you down and bless you, not kill you, and just give you life. And it's an amazing promise. And in fact, we read this in Psalm 23, the, Lord's, the, the, the Lord is my shepherd, etc. And watch what he says here at the end. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me. Guess what phrase that is? Hunt you down. Pursue. It's the same Hebrew phrase that says Saul pursued David, David through the wilderness. 
Did you know that if you're living right, you can't outrun the goodness of God? God's going to chase you down and just bless you and bless you and bless you. Now, not all the blessings come in the form of material wealth. In fact, most don't. Sometimes the blessings come through tears and through pain, but he's bringing you through the valley of the shadow of death. Um, let's see here. All right. So then he says, blessed you shall be if you do all these. Here's the blessings. And we didn't, Evelyn didn't read these earlier, but they're in the first part of chapter 28. He talks about the fruit of your womb and the fruit of your ground. What do those two have in common? There's seed. Seed is being planted and it gives life. So he's going to use what we call, you learned this in eighth grade, couplets. Remember couplets in poetry? This and this, this and this, this and this. So he starts off with, with the, the womb and the ground. And then he goes to, here we go. And he talks about your cattle and your herds. So cattle would be oxen, cows, bulls. Herds would be goats and sheep. Different types of animals, from the biggest of animals to the smallest. And then he says, from your basket to your kneading bowl. In other words, when you go out there and you pick the corn and put it in the basket, all the way to when you need it, make it into flour. From every step of the way, I'm going to bless you. When you come in to your house after a long day of work, and when you go out to work, I'm going to bless you. Uh, when your enemies come up against you, and then when they're defeated right in front of your face, God defeats them. God doesn't say, I'm not, you won't have enemies. He's just saying, I'm going to let you see me defeat them. So they will come against you one way, and then they'll flee in seven different directions. And then in your barns, what you've already built, and in all that you undertake, all your future plans that you've got written up. God says, I'm going to bless your past, and I'm going to bless your future. So the, the Lord will establish you as a, a people holy. Now watch this. We have a holy people. We've got a visible people. We've got a respected people. We have a prosperous people. We've got a fruitful people. We've got a wealthy people. And the treasures of heaven, again, it's not talking about money. It's talking about the rain that produces crops, which is what makes you wealthy. And then you've got uh, a leadership people. And then you've got a, uh, a, a, a forefront people. And then you've got a people who are on their way up, not down. And he says, and if you obey the Lord. Again, all these conditions, things are prosperous. Someone called me recently and just told me that their life was falling apart. They lost pretty much everything. Their family crumbled, their job has crumbled, and they're like, I feel like God betrayed me. But I can make a direct connection between they weren't obeying God, but they still expected the blessings of God. And, and the best thing you can do for the, your brothers and sisters in Christ and for yourself is connect some of the negativity in your life with disobedience and be honest enough to say, you know what, yeah, I kind of brought that upon myself. Now again, don't be Job's friends where you think that every bad thing in your life is because you're disobedient to God. That's where you have to go before God and say, God, okay, I have cancer. Did I cause this or is this just a trial to glorify you? You don't know. You don't always know. You have to seek God on that. Now, there's sometimes you can make a direct connection. You got cancer, six packs a week. Okay, <laughs> I can see a connection there. But sometimes, you know, there's people who live a good life, like my brother did, healthy, ate right, and all that stuff, pancreatic cancer, like that. It was just in his genetics. And you, you can't point to everything and say that it was discipline from God. So um, let me, if you don't get anything else, please get this. This will help you straighten out your theology and all the Bible verses. When you got saved, and that's that little star there, okay, you entered into a relationship with God. He was your father, you're his child, Jesus is your elder brother, according to the book of Hebrews. I'm not just making that up, okay? So you are in the family of God. That is a straight, unchangeable, indefinite line that goes out into eternity. Isn't that what you were taught in math class? That's an infinite line going out into eternity. Your relationship with God, if you were truly born again, truly saved, that line does not change, okay? But there's another line, and that's your fellowship. This is how close you are to God how well you're walking with him. And believe me, you have lots of ups and downs. Everybody who has ups and downs said amen. 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 Okay. And thank God that you are saved by the red line and not by the blue line. Okay. Many denominations can't get this straight. They're like, oh, 
man, you better die when the blue line's up, or else you go to you'll go to hell or purgatory, or you bet you know the blue line, you know, you and they're up and down. And don't you understand? We all have ups and downs. David had ups and major downs, and he was still called the apple of God's eye. Okay? Rick and and Heather got to go on a great trip here recently to celebrate Rick's 29th birthday. And uh, Rick, what, what's your all's wedding anniversary? September 5th, what day? I mean, what year? 2005? Okay, so your marriage is that red line. You've, you're just as married today as you were back there in 2005, right? Amen. But have you not had ups and downs? So if you're having a down day and Heather doesn't want to even talk to you because you've been a jerk, does that mean you're not married? You're still married. And when you get born again, you're still a child of God by that red line, by the blood of Jesus Christ. We want The blessings come with the blue line. Salvation comes with the red line. And if you can understand that principle right there, you will be ahead of a whole lot of people, unfortunately. So in Galatians chapter 3, it talks about the curse and the blessing. Just like he listed these, these 12 curses and these 12 blessings here in Deuteronomy 27 and 28. And so with that in mind, Galatians 3 says, Christ redeemed us from what? The curse of the law. We were saved from all those curses because the law basically says, here's perfection. Guess what? You're not it. Try. Try again. Try again. You know, if, if I held my hand up here and I said to one of the little kids in the room, hey, jump up and touch it. Jump and touch it. Now, there's nothing wrong with a good standard and trying to jump high, but they're never going to make it. And he says that cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree so that in Christ, the blessing of Abraham, what was the blessing of Abraham? That you would be my people, might come to the Gentiles, that's us, so that we might receive the promise of sp promised spirit through what? Through good works, through 10 commandments, through baptism, through giving to the homeless? No, through what, everybody? Through faith. You put your faith and trust in Christ, and he saves you and puts you on that straight line. So you can trust in Christ today to save you from the punishment that you deserve if you'll confess him as your Lord and your Savior. I want everybody, if you would, if you don't mind, just bow your heads and close your eyes. I'm asking you to do that just to block out every distraction. And I want to ask you today, just like Rick pointed back to the day they got married, can you point back to the day that you were born again when you put your faith and trust in Christ? You gave him your life because he gave his life for you. Have you had that time? If you're not sure, you can make that happen today. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. I'm not going to ask you to come forward. This is between you and God. And if you want to trust Christ, just let him know that you believe in him, that he died on the cross for you, that he was buried, and on the third day he rose again victorious. He did that all to save your soul that you could not keep his Ten Commandments even if you tried. And you could say, he could save you right now. Why not have a conversation with him in your heart right now? Father in heaven, thank you so much for Christ who fulfilled the law, who took us out from under the curse of all these strange commandments so that we could live free for you, to honor you and, and to live for you, not in order to be saved, but because we are saved. We just pray that you would, uh, if there's someone here today or someone who's watching online who trusted you, I pray that you would just help them to take the next steps in their life as a new believer in you. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. If you trusted Christ today, I, I'd love to hear from you. This is my cell phone number. Please text me or call me anytime about anything, but especially if you made a decision today. Um, I'm going to switch the order up. I'm going to do question and answer now and then communion later, guys, just in case you know. Um, so let me, uh, in fact, Amanda, would you mind helping me with question and answer again since Sophia's not here today? So if you have any questions, feel free to text them in now. You could also just raise your hand and ask it if you'd rather do that. Um, <clears throat> there you go. <laughs> any questions? Any questions at all? Anybody? Go ahead, Patrick. Seriously? Or? Okay, how did it do with the, uh, the culture of when it got sent? Um, first, why did they have to build another altar? Or are they hanging on the area that I'm with it? Okay, that's a great question. So the Ark of the Covenant had the mercy seat. Yeah. 
which was a type of altar. But in the tabernacle. Okay, I follow you. Okay, that's a great question. Okay, I didn't, that, you're right. Let me think about that. So I know that some of these sacrifices were regional, and it's like if, you, if the place of sacrifice is too far, do it here. So that could be it. I also think that since this was an inaugural speech as they're about to enter in, it was for this place and time here, and that we'll leave these here. As Remember when we first entered in? That's my guess. But let me study farther than that. That's a great question. Patrick always asks me the hardest questions. Oh, my gosh. You get this one. Well, it says a, ha a stone not cut with human hands, but it was cut by God. So I don't think it's uncut because it's the stone that the builders rejected that became the chief cornerstone. So it was cut, but not with human hands. So yeah, good question. You have any more hard ones for me? Okay, I'll keep trying. Okay, there we go. I'll have to study more on the first one though, because that's a great question. I don't know. This is two questions. I'll give you the first one. Yeah, what's with two questions? One at a time, people. In the garden, the serpent tricked Eve into eating the fruit by saying, the day you eat of it, you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Don't humans already know a sense of good and evil? What did the serpent mean when he said this? That, that's a great question. Um, so, knowing good and evil, it's like Adam, it's the same word, Adam knew his wife Eve and she conceived and bare his son. You'll experience good and evil. And when he said you'll be like God, in other words, God decides what's good and evil, and human beings will say, no, no, I'm going to decide for myself what is good and evil. And then you're going to experience it firsthand in that situation. Um, so that's, that's our generation today. It's like everybody determines their own what? Their own truth. That flies totally in the face of God. As in, you're not going to tell me what's good. This is the, the Garden of Eden all over again. You are not going to tell us what we can and cannot do. I, every human being decides that for themselves. And God's like, um, I made you. And just like your mom told you, I brought you into this world. I can take you out. Okay? And we do not, the whole idea of trusting Christ your Savior is you say, I will no longer determine what's right and wrong for me. Jesus, you determine it for me. If you haven't made that decision, you haven't been saved. You can say, oh, I don't want to go to hell, so I'll trust, I'll pray this cute little prayer, and that way I'm trusting Jesus as my Savior. No, the Bible says you confess him as Lord and Savior. You can't separate the two sides of the same coin. Um, what was the second part? Second question. When God cursed the snake, he said, on your belly you shall go. Does this mean that the snake originally looked different than what it is now? Some people think so. I don't know. I don't think there's enough evidence. Some people think that, that the snake resembled a reptile, and God took away his legs and caused him to crawl upon the belly of the earth. I don't know if he did that previously, but the phrase, the, eat the dust of the earth, it's kind of like when you're in a car race and you say, eat my dust, okay? It's like, I've, be I've beaten you, I've defeated you. It's the same thing there. It's God saying, hey, eat my dust, okay? It's basically what he's saying. I don't know how literal, I think it was a literal snake, okay? I just don't know whether God changed the way it traveled. We can speculate. If you gave all your perfect livestock except for your lamb, if you gave all your perfect livestock, livestock except for your lamb with blemish, now you sacrifice that? Question mark. Oh, okay. I, I get what you're saying. So basically, you sacrificed all your perfect livestock. All you have left is a lamb that's blemished. Do you sacrifice then that too? If that's all you have. Wow, left? that's that's a great question. That's an interesting hypothetical. Um, assuming that you got down to that many sins, I guess. <laughs> there you go. You read my mind, Patrick. Good job. Patrick said you would just go purchase one, which is what they often did. Remember, in, remember we studied a few chapters ago that in Deuteronomy, that if the temple was too far, what you'd do is you'd sell this lamb, travel to the temple, buy another lamb, and then do that. And then, that's, that's what, doesn't that remind us of what Jesus did in the temple? When he cleansed the temple at the beginning of his ministry, and he cleansed it at the end? What did he cleanse it for? Because they were, tr they were selling lambs, and here's what they would do. Someone would travel all the way from Jericho to Jerusalem with a perfect lamb. The priest would go, um, it's not perfect. Like, what, what do you mean? I'm the priest. I say it's not perfect. Go sell it to my brother over here who's going to sell you a lamb at a marked-up value because they're in cahoots. 
They're, 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 they were, it was all scam. They were telling lam, saying lambs weren't perfect that were, and they were ripping people off, and people were having to exchange their money and all that stuff. And you know where they were doing it? Here's, the, here's what really ticked Jesus off. They're doing it in the court of the Gentiles. They were using it as a, 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 a flea market. What was the court of the Gentiles for? So the Gentiles could come and say, you know what? Your God really is the true God. We want to worship him too. We're going to worship him in our spot of the temple. And they had it all cluttered with animals. They're like, we don't want Gentiles here. Man, and that's why Jesus was really ticked because they were a temple that stopped reaching the lost. Ooh, what if a church does that? And then Jesus says something about putting Ichabod on the door. Like, you, you don't care about the lost anymore? Yeah, we'll close your church down. And that's why 3,000 churches a year in America shut their doors. Because they're like, oh, we're going to... We're going to sing our hymns our way. We're not going to do anything to reach young people. We're going to be KJV Bible only, and we're going to do all this stuff, and we don't care about young people and lost people We're because we're worshiping our tradition, and that's why they're dying left and right, left and right. Sorry, I chased the rabbit oh, there. No, no, a comment. NF has a song that says, the real you is not defined by the size of your office. The real you is who you are when no one is watching. Good. And who's that song by? NF. Okay, yeah. It's a lyric. Good song. Um, if you were saved at a very young age and then distanced yourself from God for many years, how can you know that you are truly saved today? Great, great question. So, is it, I think it's First John. It says, the Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. So you have to look back at that decision you made and say, did I understand the gospel? that Jesus died for my sins, that he was buried, and on the third day he rose again, and that was my only hope of salvation. If that's what you trusted in, then yes, you've been away for the Lord, and I'm not going to put a timetable on God. Some people could be away from God for six days, and God <laughs> smacks them right into place. Some people can be away from God for 16 years before they get knocked back into place. It's God's timing. So, But if you've got reason to doubt that decision, if you kind of went forward to vacation Bible school because all your friends did, you might, there's no, nothing stopping you from, from making that decision today. Lord, I don't know, maybe I didn't understand it when I was 12, but right now I know that I want to give my life to you, and I know that you're my only hope of salvation and what you did on the cross. I believe in you. Then God's not going to play games say, oh, no, we got to pick one. got to pick one. It's not a shell game. So is that it? All right, cool. All right.